Hello, kindred spirits, and welcome to episode four of the Talking Appalachian podcast. I'm excited to bring you a new interview with Silas House at the campus of UVA's College at Wise. After Silas gave a presentation, we met up and we sat by the lake, which is near the David J. Pryor Convocation Center. It was just a beautiful afternoon, and we were watching the ducks, and we had some little kids fishing, so you might hear a little background noise um, while we're talking. And this is also the second outdoor podcast that I've done, and so it makes it a little bit tricky with sound. Hope you enjoy. So we're sitting here at UVA Wise, and we're looking at a lake, and it's a beautiful day. You just gave a really great talk about accent and read the essay, which thank you from Talking Appalachian. and I always appreciate it when you share that, but it is a beautiful essay. But the last time I interviewed you was, we were just saying, was a couple of years ago, and a lot's happened in your life since yeah. that time. So you've been named Kentucky Poet Laureate. Tell me what that's like. Well, it's daunting. You only have two years and you feel like you're racing to accomplish everything you want to, you know, because I'm trying to work in the schools, also doing a lot of uh, stuff with the tourism department to to use our literary heritage as part of, to draw people to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I'm starting a podcast to give writing lessons, make those accessible to anyone. So there's just a lot of moving parts to it, you know, and just uh, trying to represent the the literary community as well as I can in Kentucky for a couple of years. Yeah. What's the name of your podcast going to be? Probably just writing lessons. I'm not sure yet. I like that. Writing lessons works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it tells you exactly what it is. So you got me to thinking about story and the concept of storytelling and all of the work that you've been doing. Like I was telling you when we were walking to the lake here, you are so busy, but you've got your hands in a whole lot of stuff. You, you're you doing journalism, like I'm thinking garden and gun and time and you're doing um, creative work with videos and everything you do is grounded in story in one way or another. And I really thought about the importance of story the other day because, you know, I was asked to come talk about story and storytelling to a group of people whose job it is to raise money. And I thought, I never thought about storytelling and raising money mm -hmm. going together, but yeah. it, it makes perfect sense. So let's talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing and how that's grounded in story and, and then maybe how accent has factored in to some of the work that you're doing. Well, I don't think I've ever met anybody who didn't like to be told a story, but like everyone loves stories. And it's just primal. I think it's in our DNA. I think if you go back to the first group of people gathered around fire, to some degree, they're telling a story to each other. And they told stories on cave walls. Right. They told I mean, stories through art. It's just foundational. It's part of being a community yeah. is to tell a story. I mean, I just don't know how to move through the day without consuming stories and telling stories. I think a big part of that is being around people who were always talking. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for that. Yeah, you know? me too. I mean, they were quiet in their own way, but they were also always telling a story. And there was never, there was nothing too small that couldn't be made into a big story. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, people in my family could go to the grocery store and come back and it would be this epic tale that they would tell. Yeah. You know, it's just a natural ability to embellish and exaggerate, but also tell the truth. Mm -hmm. The essential truth is more important than the real truth in storytelling, you yeah. know, things like that. So as far as doing lots of different kinds of things, like, you know, I'm working on a novel, I'm working on a short story, I'm writing a poem, I'm doing feature writing for magazines like Garden and Gun and Time and The Atlantic and The Bitter Southerner and Salvation South. I recently worked on a creative video with Tyler Childers. The thing is, I feed off the energy of all of those. And it's like one thing helps me do another thing. Mm -hmm. It's like being creative in any way, I think, keeps that fire burning. And you have to you have to keep that fire stoked all the time. So I never feel overwhelmed by any of that creative work. I feel overwhelmed by some of the administrative stuff that goes with it. I hear you. <laughs> Emails. Yeah. You know, um, just scheduling and keeping up with stuff. Yeah. That's the hard part. But the creative part is always just, it's fuel. PBS is, did a series called Storytellers, and that it's like a TV series. But then they also did a web series that accompanied that. I'm part of the web series, but not the TV series. I'm part of the online part of that mm -hmm. and i think each southern state or 11 southern states 
have their own online component that goes with that. And you were talking about the complication of the love story, and we can get into love story now, the love story with Appalachia and how you can love something and hate it. And I think you said this in there and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And that is such a profound, that's something when I really got into the work that I do, that is such a broad and deep thing when you start really trying to explore the complication that is Appalachia and the diversity that is Appalachia. But it's the same thing with accent. It's the same thing with the way that we talk. So many people who live here hate the way they sound and so many love the way they sound. And then there are those people who are in between because of the way that we're perceived. But can you talk a little bit about that, about Appalachia and complication and what that means to you and how you try to work that into what you do? Well, you know, like I always say, you can love a place and hate it and everything in between. For me, the most interesting part is the everything in between. And I think when I'm creating a piece of art, that's what I'm focused on more than anything. The love shows up in there a whole lot. Hate is a strong word. That's it sort is. of a shorthand word. But I think for me, it's more of a, a frustration would probably be a better word. And the frustration shows up sometimes. But mostly what I'm exploring is just the complication. I think that's the role of art. It's like, you know, if we think about the internet, it seems like the internet operates very much in absolutes. Well, art must be the opposite of that. Art should never operate in the absolute. So since we are such a digital culture now and such an internet-rooted culture, I think that makes art more important than ever mm -hmm. because it does explore those complications. Let's say that I'm telling a story that has a social issue involved. Mm -hmm. I can much better reach somebody if I'm telling that via a story instead of just like having an agenda or just yeah. pushing my opinion down somebody's throat. Instead, if I show a human story playing out against that, then it, it can... You can relate to that in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I know that some people love statistics and all that, but most people don't. And I don't. So, like, you know, if I want to talk about, I don't know, the history of coal in Appalachia, to me it's much more interesting to show a family who has been lifted up out of poverty via the coal industry but have also been up against great environmental devastation. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you're focusing on the between of those two polar sort of yeah. opposites. And you have this human story play out. That's much more interesting to me than reading a bunch of statistics about coal and poverty and et cetera. You were talking about accent and poverty. Rural accents are associated with poverty. I recently was reminded that they're also associated with a lack of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Because someone who knows my work said to me, I was talking about a coworker, and I said, well, what do you think about your new coworker? And the person said, well, they've got a hillbilly redneck accent, so I don't know how smart they are. Oh, you grow up sort of shy about defending your turf. But I said, please don't ever say that to me again. Not good for you. It's like, right. that's my work. Right. You know, and I said, don't say that to other people if you don't want to hurt someone. It was hard, and I can't believe it was hard, but it was hard yeah. not to laugh it off or go along with it yeah. because that's what I've done my whole life. Yeah. Because you don't want to make, you Talk don't want to. Lot and, yeah, yeah. You don't want to create that discomfort that may stay there forever. But it's so unfair because they're the ones that are in the room. I know. And then we make, we make ourselves feel I like know. That. But yeah. I think it is so embedded in our psyche. That, like you said, when people say, I'm sorry, you're from Eastern Kentucky, I don't think they think about it right. before it comes out. No, comes out. they don't even understand how malicious that is. Who wants to be told that where they're from is, is a terrible place that, exactly. that should be escaped from? I mean, I don't get how they think that's funny. It just it kind of boggles my mind. But at the same time, I know that their entire lives, they've been pummeled by a barrage of especially visual imagery that tells them, you know, that people here are not worth anything and are just laughable. And I think, yes, people associate this accent with poverty and they associate it with being stupid. But if you unpack that, a lot of people think that poverty equals stupidity. Mm -hmm. They don't put context in. They don't think about the way that, that people, you know, have been born into poverty and the way that systems keep them impoverished and things like that. They right. think, oh, they're just stupid. And that's the reason they haven't gotten out of poverty. Yeah. And I mean, we all, you know, anybody that has ever lived within side of poverty knows that that's not true. Right. So it's just, again, it's just such a negating thing. And in a way, it creates this endless cycle because, you know, when the whole culture thinks 
you're you're poor because you're stupid then to some degree you're kept poor by that you know yeah. when you know you're raised and you're told that you're no good to some degree you start to believe that yeah. until somebody pulls it out pulls you out of that or you pull yourself out of it like i always say you know i was just really lucky to it was drilled into me to have a strong identity and to know who we were mm -hmm. and that's so important i think and a lot of people that I know who have struggled with being from Appalachia and being ashamed of who they are and all that <clears throat> is because their families participated in that shame, mm -hmm. not just the media, not just the whole world, but even their families were perpetuating that idea. You've got to get out of here. You, you have to change who you, how you talk. You can't let people know where you're from Yeah. or you'll never rise up. Exactly. And I think there's some truth in that, that it is an obstacle that does hold, hold you back, but you just have to work harder and fight harder. It's not fair. Yeah. I know you spent some time with one of our favorite people, Lee Smith, and you did that beautiful article for Garden Gun. So talk to me about that. Well, speaking of Lee Smith, she's one of the people I think that helped me to know it was okay to hold on to my accent. Me too. Now she has a complex accent. She does. Because it's not just Southwest Virginia. It's informed by uh, sort of a upper class Alabama, Richmond, you know, and I, it's, mm -hmm. you can hear all those pieces coming together in her accent, but ultimately it's a very Southern accent and it's a very distinct accent. And she's never been ashamed of that mm -hmm. or tried to, to be anything that she wasn't. I think that I started to hear Lee speak when I was in my early twenties, right at that time when a lot of people think, oh, I have to change the way I talk, you know, and hearing her on the Diane Reem show or whatever, and hearing that voice was like, wow, I can hear the Appalachian in there and I can hear the Southern in there. And mm -hmm. She's on the Diane Reem show. So I just, I think it's immeasurable for me, the ways that Lee Smith has influenced me and helped me. I, I mean, I know that it's, it's become a cliche because it's true to talk about how generous she is, but I can't talk about her and not mention that because she's been so she generous. Is. Mm -hmm. And being a working writer myself, I know how hard that is to like tend to every manuscript that you get and try to do. I mean, you can only do so much, but it seems like to me, she has, has gone above and beyond. And so, yeah, I got to hang out with her while I was writing a feature on her for Garden and Gun Magazine. Spent a couple of days with her. I mean, talk about a storyteller. Just everything is a doorway to a story with Lee. And, you know, she's in her late 70s. She's mm -hmm. lived away from the Appalachian region for, I don't know, 50 years, I guess. And she told me she still had this ache in homesickness that, really? never, that never goes away. That And her house is, is like Appalachia set down near Chapel Hill yeah. in the re research triangle. But her house is just full of like artifacts from her hometown, quilts and, you know, the, the food she cooks. It's like very much an Appalachian household. And I think that's why I always talk about the way being Appalachian feels very akin to the immigrant experience mm -hmm. because immigrants always take their food ways and their language, uh, their crafts ways, you know, any way they can carry their culture with them. Exactly. And especially in intangible ways, they do it. And Appalachian people do that too. I mean, I know so many people who were raised up north but they were raised in Appalachian households because their parents, you know, were homesick their whole lives. And that was the way they, that was the balm they gave themselves was to cook their food and to have their home language and things like that. Didn't the Scots-Irish have a tradition of bringing embers, of bringing mm -hmm. ashes from their home fires yes. with them when they right. moved? Is that where we got the expression home fires, keep the home fires burning, yeah, I wonder? I think so. I just think yeah. that's a beautiful thing to think about, yes. that that symbol of place. For sure. So it sounds like she's kind of done that in her yeah. own way. It's funny that we've come full circle because Lee, when I met her in the late 90s, I think I told you this a long time ago, when I met her in the late 90s at a book signing, she had come to Southwest Virginia. And I, you know how it is when you're young and your writer is like a rock star, your favorite writer. You just, you, it's hard to approach them and everything. And I, I waited to the end of the line and I approached her and I said, I just love your writing and I want, I want to be a writer. And she goes, well, do you write? And I said, yes. And she goes, then you're a writer, <laughs> you know, and it was so profound that I was telling her how, you know, I'm, I was struggling and I was really trying. And she said, 
you need to talk to Silas House. I want you to try to meet Silas House. And she said, and you need to go to Hindman. Mm-hmm. And so the ne- when I read Clay's Quilt, you were in, um, I'm trying to remember where you went. I went specifically, spent the night to go to your night. book signing. I feel like it was somewhere in Kentucky, but I can't remember anyway. I've, I did the same thing. I waited to the end of the line uh-huh. to meet you. And, it, and that's been so many years ago, but it's just neat that we're here now because uh-huh. Lee, you know, yeah. encouraged that and yeah she's created a whole network of people she has and adriana trigioni is the same way mm-hmm. she's so generous too the generosity along appalachian riders is on parallels it feels very much like a family yeah and also in the way that you know we sort of we can always pick right up where we left off and yeah there's a shorthand because part of that shorthand is that we have had a similar experience in the literary world of being taken seriously, mm-hmm. of sometimes being exoticized, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. And also, I think one thing that really struck me, Lee Smith sent me to the Appalachian Writers Workshop in Hyman, like, like she did you. I had been to other writers' workshops, and I just felt so out of place. But here, I could sit on the porch, and I could talk to somebody at length about mm-hmm. a novel or a poem, But we could also talk about, like, how do you make your cornbread? Or, you know, it was was like there were these markers of being rural and Appalachian, but also markers of being somebody that loved literature. And it was the only place I'd ever seen that come together. Yeah, it's a community for sure. Because to some degree, you know, a lot of literary gatherings can be pretty snooty. And um, the academic world and the literary world are very similar Mm -hmm. in one way is that working class people have not for too long been a part of that, you know, and so, and also rural and Appalachian people haven't either. So I often feel like an outsider in the literary and academic worlds. Yeah, I understand. So for to have a place like the Appalachian Writers Workshop or the Mountain Heritage Literary Festival or other gatherings in the region where you have people who are so like-minded who not only care deeply about literature, but also care deeply about their own culture. Yeah. It's the best. Well, I couldn't let you let you go without asking you about your current project. That's the one question everybody asks writers. What are you working on now? What's coming down the pipe for people? I've just uh, put together a book of select short stories because I've published short stories ever since it was since before I was published as a novelist, but I've, those have never been a book. So I've sort of collected the ones that were thematically similar. Mm-hmm and put them together it sort of centers on people who are othered in their own communities but also by the by the rest of the world so it's sort of that idea of you know struggling to find your place um as somebody who's set apart in appalachian culture but also in the larger world because you're appalachian i'm hoping it will be called neon moon um, which is my favorite story in the collection and it's my favorite country song Uh uh-huh and so it's also a song that has sort of become a cult song for LGBT rural people um, who just love that song. Yeah. Um, and I'm working on a collection of poetry. I don't know, you know, when that will ever be done, but I'm I'm working on more poems than I have been in the past. I'm loving that form. Those are the main two projects I have going on right now. Mm-hmm. I have a novel in my head. I haven't really started writing it yet, but I'm, that's the way I write novels. I'll think about it for a year or two. And really not write anything down. I just like study on it and build the characters, figure out what I want to do thematically, yeah. and then I start writing. We could talk all day. I know. It's <laughs> it's just good to sit here and look at some water and some trees and some ducks. And I love seeing the children fishing while we're the, talking about Appalachia. I know. We see the kids fishing. I know. We live near a river, too, so we spend a whole lot of time down there. So Yeah. there's mm-hmm. uh, You know, I was talking earlier about being gathered around a fire and stories being told. Also... I always love to see the way people are drawn to water. You know, that's such a primal thing for us, too. It is. And and it's such a, well, you know, when you're from Appalachia, you're used to bodies of water being around all the time. As much as we're defined by our mountains, we're defined by our bodies of water. That's true. You know, people say what creek they're from or, you know, the community will be there because of the creek or whatever. You get baptized in the creek. You get baptized in the river. Yeah. Well, I took, um, a few years ago, I took 22 students from Berea College to Ireland. And I guess about half of them were from Appalachia and half were not. Everywhere we went that would have a body of water, the Appalachian students would get in it. And the non-Appalachian <laughs> students would sort of be sitting on the bank, like shaking their heads, like, what are y'all doing? This water's freezing. 
but the Appalachian students had to get in the water. And I've just thought so much about that, how distinctly divided the group was in that way. Yeah. So they had to wait. They had to, you know, splash each other or something. They were just drawn to the water in a different way than the non-Appalachian students. And I think that's just because we are so defined by our bodies of water. And that's something I know when we go through dog days, it's like the river's down, the river's down, you know, you can't kayak or you worry about it. You know, that poor river, it's low. Yeah. One place we went, the place that is most special to me in Ireland, Glendalough, the Appalachian students actually baptized each other. You know, it was, it didn't have necessarily, it wasn't a religious connotation. It was just more like, we want to be fully immersed in Ireland and this is the place to Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I'll get over there someday. I've, I don't know I've got to there. get over there. You will have sensory overload, I think, you know, because it's like. I'm sure. Something in your DNA is reacting. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been a wonderful time. I know you've got to get back, and it was just then to see you talking to all these teachers today about how important rural students are and and how to help them embrace that. And so that was really meaningful. Thank you. Good to see you. It's good to see you. It's always good to be alive. If you like the content I'm putting into the world about the culture of Appalachia and you just want to support the podcast, there are links in my show notes where you can do just that. Whether your support buys me a cup of coffee during these long hours of editing, I do it all myself. Or if you want to offer a monthly contribution, for which I'm happy to include your name or organization or your book as a supporter on our show notes and give you early access to episodes and other perks. Maybe you can just share the episodes you love the most and spread the word about us, which is totally free. I appreciate you and any support you have to spare. Find me on patreon.com slash talking Appalachian podcast or at talking Appalachian on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to keep talking Appalachian.